yours too. <laughs> um, so moving on uh, into the next part of the program, uh, our next speaker is artist Paige Emery, who's exploring the ecological body and the ritual interactions that weave worlds. Her work bridges poetics and praxis, mysticism and theory, healing rituals, and environmental science. Uh, this takes shape through a variety of different kinds of works, art installations for intercommunication between humans and non-humans, sound pieces for deep listening between the psychic and physical realms, and healing gardens for nonlinear time and regenerative metabolism. Uh, you can see her sculptural works in the back of the theater. They're the large uh, blue structures. Um, and at that, I'll leave it over to Paige to, to tell you more about those works. Give us a couple seconds as we get set up. Thanks so much, guys. Hi, everyone. Are you receiving the sound? Yeah, it's coming through on this side. It doesn't really have to.
Open, create environment. I would like to open with three deep breaths together if you feel willing and able to join me. Inhale through your nose, fill up your stomach and your lungs to the top of your head. Exhale out any tension in your body physical manifestations of stress below the ground. Another deep inhale through your nose. Up your stomach and your lungs. Exhale a slow, long breath. And exhale out any feelings of stress any expectations of what this is, of what this is going to be, down through your toes, down to the ground. Last inhale, fill up your stomach, fill up your lungs to their greatest capacity, and hold your breath at the top of your head. And with this exhale, I would like you to exhale out any anxieties relating to time and a nice audible sigh together. <sighs> How do we dream outside of someone else's dream? This is not only a question of how, but when. An opening of the when can resituate the how. An opening of the when can be done through divinatory practices, an oneric method, an oneric lens to think through for emancipatory healing. Ourselves, a geological force with footsteps of climate collapse further than our own consciousness, need a sense of time beyond ourselves. world. 
building between the hopelessness of a dying world and the hope of actualizing a new one, I'm exploring divination as a conduit outside the hold of a deterministic capture, a way of rather than predicting the future, unpredicting the future. Adaption, release. The dominating timescape, fabricated with westernized capitalist infrastructure, is the linear progressive one, the one that Ursula Le Guin refers to as time's killing arrow mode of the techno-heroic, where progress rides an insatiable growth on the wheels of a goal-oriented acceleration that modernity has evolved with. Heroic timescape is a hunger for material permanence that can outlive death, a race against the clock. Disrupting death means disrupting the cycles that allow death to bring life. This disruption is the climate crisis. One could pose that capitalism runs by its own apparatus of divinatory method, a neoliberal market set to determine the future, a future of arbitrary value, preserved to justify ecological devastation, preserved to justify the debt held in our bodies in a multitude of manifestations from running on borrowed time. The self-fulfilling prophetic machine can be seen as a force towards what Mark Fisher has called the cancellation of the future. But this does not have to be a cancellation of all futures, just a cancellation of the times killing arrow mode linear progressive one that is currently dominating. Swimming in the magma of this chrono capture, how do we find a different way to relate to the future? Memories are what we create our future with, so undoing preconceived ways of knowing possibility spaces. In the practice of divination, a preliminary step is the suspension of rational thoughts that would otherwise be mechanically governing one's perspective. In order to receive guidance for something you do not know, you can't know what you're looking for. Guidance transmitted through a sort of medium, whether a book, a than a be- 
practices we live out co-write our cosmologies. And we urgently need practices that can help us cope between a dying way of worlding and a new one we want to exist. Embedded within this rehabituating ritual modality, divination is not a single event or answer, but a continual practice of how we can consciously relate to an ecological future. Attention. Listening is presence by way of absence, resonance by way of receptivity. In such an urgent time, can we slow down time? Slow, careful practice of attention in this atmosphere of interaction is needed to reconfigure the fabric we are enmeshed in in order to understand how to better respond. I meditated on this in a recent installation at Biosphere 2, drawing a parallel between dendromancy or tree divination and dendrochronology or the science of dating by tree rings that was founded where Biosphere 2 is located. Dendromancy, an ancient tradition that spawned the Celtic language of trees, based on semiotic connection from communing with trees of the landscape, the symbolic meanings have been interpreted, intuited for guidance. It could be said that the intuiting comes from seeing the present to understand the future. Dendrochronology, a scientific method originated from an astronomer's attempt at observing sunspots through trees which revealed the realization that tree rings reveal a wealth of information about their local climates. A gaze reaching outwards and beyond the earth reflected back to a gaze in a localized environment where one deeply observes the lines of trees. Within the lines of trees, libraries of timestamps have recalibrated what we know about environmental changes and have become a part of a chronological dance that is informing forecasting within climate science. And the threads woven between this mystical practice and this scientific one lie not only in telling time with trees, but also in the perspective of more than human participation with time that can help us understand what conditions make certain ecological futures possible to be brought into the present. Extension, the body outside of itself. Another elemental divinatory method to think through is water scrying. The word descrying, the word scrying comes from the word descrying, which means to catch sight of something far away or dim by observing very carefully. Water scrying, a divinatory method by which one gazes into water in a meditative state, asks guidance for the unknown, and then employs intuition to pull out images and sensory correspondence. Gazes softly to the point of trance, the reflective surfaces dance into shape forms 
memory of change. This will close coming back to the form of ritual, practice. A process-focused repetition lays the groundwork for a continual catalyst of change. In tumultuous landscapes between worlds, we will have to go through release and renewal again and again. Maybe divinatory practice is a way of coping as we seek forms of endurance to embrace. Maybe a breaking open of time as a pivot of recursivity, shaping a circle into a spiral. Maybe a re-remembering like rolling waves folding back into themselves within each fold, dreaming new memories of change. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paige. Mm -hmm. um, I think that something that really comes to mind for me in thinking through your work and thinking through these ideas about divination um, that are so practice-based is methodologies for getting started. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the audience might be able to, um, or any practical methodologies for being able to engage in this kind of sensing and feeling and um, predicting of the future. Sure, like a very practical approach, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I touched on this a little bit, but um, th so the form of the talk that I gave is actually also a form of ritual, um, which was open, create environment, release, adaption, intention, prescribe meaning, attention, um, listening by way of absence, presence by way of absence, extension, the body outside of itself, and then close, create memory of change. So with that, the first step, <laughs> opening and creating environments, so sort of setting a space where you know you can practice and not be distracted in something. And then the first step after that adaption release was one I really actually focused on throughout this talk of how much work it takes to actually undo um, habitual patterning already in our mind that would otherwise be blocking from opening up to sensing. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I have a funny anecdote, but it's not um, a confirmed fact, but, but it's something that's interesting. Um, I was talking to this researcher of um, earthquakes who studies animals' ability to predict earthquakes, which um, some animals can predict up to 48 hours, and he kind of sits with the different animals um, who can sense these. Um, and his hypothesis was that humans should be able to have this kind of sensing of earthquakes, but the biggest thing in the way of it is discourse, which is an interesting hypothesis from this uh, scientific researcher doing this kind of work. But um, so, and this is n not in any form. I love discourse and intellect and, and research and science, but it's more like to actually be able to be in a frame of thinking something new, to, um, this moment of pause and, and being able to, the non-thinking, by the way, non-thinking is um, differentiated from not thinking, where non-thinking is more just the suspension of habitual patterns, but it's a um, generative passivity, <laughs> if that um, makes sense. So much, Paige. Um, the last thing that I want to ask you about is you mentioned in your work, and obviously the to calibrate with three tree divination is is, is speaking to this, um, the relationship between dendromancy and dendrochronology. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about some of the connections or disconnections that you found in kind of relating these two uh, two different, very different kinds of of processes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um... Well, I can start by the reason I chose this. So, like I said, this, uh, the pieces are out here, but they were originally for an installation at Biosphere 2, which is the um, largest experiment on like ecological systems 
ever done on Earth the, the last time I checked, unless something has come up since then. Um, just, you know, the largest like enclosed space that has um, is able to experiment with these biomes in a way. And Biosphere 2 was started as a, um, as testing these biomes to live on Mars. And now, um, uh, down the history of events now, it's working toward on climate science. And um, I wanted to draw a parallel where, like I mentioned, dendrochronology originated from an astronomer's view out into outer space and ended up finding how much tree lines could teach us about the local environment. And um, I wanted to emphasize this point of this outward reach of this kind of like feeling of dominating frontier, like humans can go, you know, do all of these things as this mirror of like, what does that show us about our very localized environments and how we are actually like where our gaze is coming from, the point of departure our gaze is coming from and how important it is to be present with our local environments to understand this. So um, this is why I chose dendrochronology because, um, and the, the comparison is, I love how you have to look so closely. I looked at a bunch of the tree ring studies and it's um, it felt so similar because you're actually reading the lines of trees and that feels like a divination practice itself even though it is a scientific method. Um, yeah, so, I mean, similarities that maybe are um, a bit apparent there where you're looking, both practices, you're looking at the trees and reading them where, um, and I mean, the difference is, is one is taken more seriously than the other one, I guess. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Thank you so much, Paige. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you.